Hey, Mr. Fieldman, and I think a couple of classes, um, ask if you could turn the volume up so we can all hear a little bit better. Okay, all right, I will do that. Let's see. What I'm going to do is pause it, and then let's see what we have here. Okay, I see. Let's get this up, and since they didn't hear it, and we got a few minutes waiting on the classes, let's tell me what you have now. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, everyone. Are we uh, ready to start? Or oh, we still have uh, classes coming in? We're ready to start. You guys ready? Yeah. Okay, we're ready to start. Yeah, let's All get right. it. Let's get it. Let's get All it. All right. All right. I hope y'all like the song I played for you for the intro. Yes, sir. All right. Well, my name is Joe Tillman. Um, I ride a motorcycle, so in the motorcycle community, they know me as Hot Wing. And for the kids, uh, Hot Wing is because I love me some Hot Wings. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be in the classroom with you today. And we're going to talk about a little Black history. Um, and what I'm going to show you today is going to be history that you probably won't see in your history books. Okay, so we're going to get started here. Now, I will have questions and answers at the end. So anyone that has a question, you, you will have an opportunity to uh, ask your questions. And um, we're going to have a little fun at the same time. Okay, again, uh, my name is Joe. And African Americans or Black Americans have been involved in every, and when I say every, I mean every war that this country has fought from the beginning, when George Washington decided to form his revolutionary army, African-Americans at that time was part of it. However, what has been a constant from 1775 to 1951 is that we were not allowed in the war until it was uh, positively necessary for the United States to win. We were not allowed to get in until it was positively necessary for the United States to win. So with that being it, uh, let me give you a little background on me, where my passion and my story comes from. I grew up right here in Jacksonville, Florida, on the north side, right in between Reigns and Rebal. Well, in my fifth grade, we went from an all segregated school system to an integrated school system, which put me over at Forest Hill, elementary, which is right next to Rebalt Senior High. So I'm in the fifth grade, and I'm one of two black males in that fifth grade class. As we went through what we call social studies back in the day, as we went out to recess, one of my classmates who happened to be white said to me, Joe, y'all were only slaves. He didn't say it to be mean. He was stating that because that's all that was talked about in the lesson. So from my fifth grade, all the way up to graduating from the 12th grade, whenever it came to people who looked like me, there was only a few, and it was always basically the same that we studied in history. And then the rest of the le lesson was about uh, people who looked like me being slaves. So that took me into the military in 1977, where I went to my first duty station, which was Fort Stewart, Georgia. My daughter was born while I was in training, and Rochelle was born, and in the center of her chest right here was a birthmark. That birthmark looked like this, which is the 24th Infantry Patch. It's called a Toro Leaf. Because of that Toro Leaf Patch, uh, my daughter got recognized on Good Morning America. That brought attention to me, and some senior NCOs called me up to um, ask me some questions. They asked me about the Buffalo Soldiers. And these Black NCOs asked me that question. I said, who are they? And they, they told me that that was my responsibility to find out. And back then, you couldn't reach on your hip and pull up Google. I had to go to the library class. So I went to the library, and I looked it up and found out the Buffalo Soldiers were an all-Black enlisted unit that was after the Civil War. And I hadn't heard nothing about it. And as I read and seen all of the things that they had accomplished, it got me excited. And uh, let's see what we have here. OK. <laughs> and uh, uh, so what, what, what that led me into my history. 
And that led me into the passion that I have today. Now, I'm blessed to have a daughter who served. Lisa is my oldest, served 10 years in the, 11 years in the Air Force. And our son, David, graduated from what, uh, the Naval Academy on in 2012. And he's presently an officer over in Japan. So we do have a military family. Uh, going back to our history, our history. And during the Revolutionary War, you had Blacks who fought on both sides of the conflict. They were Black patriots if they fought with George Washington. They were Black loyalists if they fought with the, Euro with the uh, British. Both sides promised that we would be free, both sides. Now, the uh, George Washington did set some of the slaves free, but not all, not all. And he returned them back into slavery. The, the uh, British took some slaves up to Canada, and that's how uh, some of the uh, Blacks from America ended up into Can in Canada and Nova Scotia. Problem being is when they were told about Nova Scotia, it was in the summer. When they got to Canada, it was in the winter. So they were in for a shock. Uh, now, some of those same slaves the uh, British took to uh, Trinidad. So the, uh, the Trinidad's to this day call them the Americas. Okay. We had about 5,000 patriots of African descent in the Continental Army, Navy, and the Marine Corps. Now, we even have um, Black women who served, uh, but they served as men. They, they served as men. And the, some of these units that fought with uh, the Revolutionary Army, you will hear about later as we move into the War of 1812 and then into the uh, Civil War, okay? Uh, it, the the uh, Revolutionary War at the end, African Americans, the black soldiers, returned back to slavery. Then the United States passed a law that said anyone of African descent could not join the army. Okay, so now the War of 1812 happened. British came back, they burned the capital, they were coming up the Mississippi, so they needed blacks to fight again because they were about to lose to the British the second time. So with this law, they could not enlist blacks. So what happened? They enlisted the blacks, but the adjutant general put them in the roles as white. So they fought in the War of 1812, but fought as white men. So as we go back and look at our ancestral history, we get to the time frame of 1812, you might see an uncle that is listed as white, but actually he was black, but just registered so he can fight for the United States as being white. At the end of the War of 1812, there was an election. <laughs> Those black soldiers went to vote and they were told that they could not vote because they were black. They took it to court and protested that. The judge said, these men, as I can see, are black. However, they are registered in the census as being white, so they have the right to vote. So as you do your research, going back and looking at your ancestral history, just remember the census changed their racial identity just so that they could fight. But now after they uh, beat the British for the second time, we again was returned to slavery again. So we've up to the War of 1812 now, and now after the War of 1812, there are some things that's going on that the history books don't talk about. One of them is that we have a strong militia going on right now. We have about 150,000 trained militia because these men are meeting in cities like Philadelphia and Buffalo, and they are putting together a revolution. They're putting together a, a, uh, um, a plan to stop slavery to the point where people like Major Martin R. Delaney, when you hear people say to someone, go back to your country of African descent, well, he point blank told everyone that our country is the United States. And from here, we will not be driven by any policy that may be schemed against us. We are Americans, Black Americans. We have a birthright citizenship. So he made this clear now, his rank, was a major. 
and he was the highest ranking when the Civil War started. Major Delaney was the first African American to re reach a field grade uh, position. Major is a field grade. When the the military was uh, formed, no person of African descent can go past the rank of lieutenant because a officer, black officer, could not be in charge of any white uh, soldiers. So he could not outrank. But because of his skill level, Major uh, Delaney was able to reach the rank of major. Now, these, these militia units were, were being trained. So when you get to the movie, the movie of glory with Denzel Washington, and they show that they were not soldiers, I want to tell you, class, that these men were professional soldiers. They were not like the movie Glory depict those men. They were trained, and there is the records from officers that shows that the man, the uh, officers are saying, and these are the white officers, said that if they had a, and this is from the North, if they had a full army of men that joined of African descent, they would have been able to finish the war off in less than a week. That's how skilled they were as soldiers. But Major John S. Rock, now as you as you can see here, okay, as you can see here, they were having conventions all over. All right, uh, con congrats on that in the, in that movie as an extra. That's that's cool. Uh, you can see where Major John S. Rock was stating clearly that sooner or later, the clashing of arms will be heard in this country. Now he was saying that because these men had formed a alliance together. They were meeting, it was being planned. They actually sent people over to Africa to set up trade between Africa and the European countries. So when the revolution started, they didn't want the Europeans to jump in. So they were setting up trade to make sure that there was no need, economic need, money needs for those Europeans to come over to the aid of the United States because there was 150,000 freedmen capable of bearing arms. And when the question was asked, will the blacks fight? Dr. John S. Rock said, of course they will. Now look at this, this is March 5th, 1858. Long before the Civil War, understand that how we're depicted in some of the history books is not how it was actually going on at that time. President Lincoln, he had to hold on to the Emancipation Proclamation until the North had a, had a major victory. When he uh, wrote the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, I want you to understand, class, that he did not free one slave. The Emancipation Proclamation did not free slaves. What, it, what this Emancipation Proclamation done, it gave us as Black Americans to, the right to bear arms. And then that allowed us to free ourselves because the North was losing. So by allowing the African-Americans, which form what is called the United States Colored Troops, to get into the fight, it changed the course of the war. And then you look at the state like Texas and a national holiday like Juneteenth, understand that it was the United States Colored Troops in Texas for almost eight to 10 months fighting in Texas and then when General Granger showed up on June 19th and read the, uh, read the Emancipation Proclamation, it was a former setting. It was the United States color troops who freed Texas. So when you hear about Juneteenth, know that General Granger did not free the slaves in Texas. It was the United States color troops who freed the slaves in Texas. So again, we freed ourselves. Now let's talk about Florida. Florida, we celebrate something called May Day. May Day is because on May 20th, the Confederacy surrendered in Tallahassee. So we celebrate May Day because of that. And again, it was the second infantry United States colored troops. Who, it was the second infantry United States colored troops who were standing there with the general when the, when the Confederacy freed themselves, okay? When the, excuse me, when the Confederacy surrendered. 
Now, the governor of Florida at that time was so distraught until he had, he committed suicide. He just couldn't take the fact that we would not uh, be enslaved anymore. All right. So Florida played a major role during that during that time frame. And right on JU's campus, the men of the 54th, there are some uh, are buried there today. Uh, men from the 54th. OK. Now, as I said, we fought under the infantry, cavalry, artillery, musicians, pioneers and sellers, sellers. And we were in some of the major battles and caused the United States, the North, to be able to continue to be called the United States. Now, some of the individuals that were that I'm going to highlight uh, in Jefferson Davis, he had a spy working in his home, didn't even know it because the people like Harriet Tugman was trained spies. She went to Canada, learned how to be a spy, came back and was down in the South and was one of the best spies for the Union Army. The gentleman you sit here, see sitting, Robert Smalls, Robert Smalls uh, stole the Confederacy ship, sailed through Confederacy checkpoints and turned it over to the Union Army. Later, he went back to South Carolina, ran for Congress and won. Now, some of Robert Small's family, his daughter and others, live right in live Oak, Florida. And Sergeant Pawa Beatty, Beatty was the first to receive a Medal of Honor. Now, some people uh, will, will argue the point who was first, but he received the Medal of Honor. And that's the most important. We'll worry about who was first later. Now, as we move out of, whoa, as we move out of the Civil War, we were getting ready to go into peacetime. Now, this is where the Buffalo Soldiers come in. I'm going to show you a short video, and then we'll get back into uh, the presentation. So get you some popcorn, get ready, and we're going to watch this video. Uh, this is after the Civil War. The buildings here at Fort McCavett are quiet, long deserted. But once, this was a bustling outpost, part of a huge military experiment, an experiment that was expected to fail. Instead, it produced some of the fiercest fighters in the history of the United States military. The time was the 1860s. The western frontier was steeped in turmoil. The settlers throughout this area were unprotected. Tormented by outlaws, thieves, and hostile Indians, the U.S. government formed six regiments of African-American troops, known as the Buffalo Soldiers. It's troops in line for the buffalo, get a moving, get a moving, then squadron mass when the bugle blows, moving into line. Gonna fight all day, gonna fight all night. We got... Oh, sorry about that, class our money on the buffalo somebody bet on the fight for over 100 years the legacy of the buffalo soldiers was lost in a baffling historical void but today these men are finally getting their due recognition the true story of the 9th and the 10th Calvary has been embraced by both scholars and an eager public. The Indian feared them because of his bravery and how he fought. The reason they gave him, they called him the Buffalo Soldier because of the texture of his hair and the dark, fierce eyes. The buffalo had the dark brown eyes and showed no fear. And the black man fought with such ferocity and showed no fear. And that's why the Indian gave them this name, because he feared and respected the buffalo, and he learned to fear and respect the black soldier as well. 75% of the soldiers that settled this area were buffalo soldiers. The only white men that were with them were the commanding officers. 75%. Almost all of the forts were manned and built by buffalo soldiers. They see on TV, they see all the modern portrays, 
of things and they see white cavalrymen coming in and doing these things but what they don't realize the white cavalrymen did come but after the buffalo soldier had paved the way for him built the forts for him built the houses made the bridges did the roads did the work and now it's so important so that their families will understand the hardships that these men went through and the pride that goes with it. The reason I joined was for a steady income. Why, I made a whole $13 a month. That ain't funny, that's more money than I'd ever had. Ken Pollard discovered the legacy of the Buffalo Soldiers in the late 1980s. Since then, he's traveled throughout Texas, sharing that knowledge with kids. I was once a captured slave. Now I'm just a black man who came to be. I was a hard-riding hero for the 9th Cavalry. Tell me how did they survive in this new land? I am a buffalo soldier. How you doing, trooper? Fine. <laughs> That's our summer uniform, by the way. You don't wonder it's hot. <laughs> well, it's also the winter uniform. At attention, trooper. I do it. I got all, you want the pants too? <laughs> I found out about the Buffalo Soldiers by accident. I uh, happened to walk into Fort Griffin and I asked that manager why he had all these pictures on his wall. The pictures were of black folks. And that's when he started telling me about the Buffalo Soldiers. And this is like five years ago. So I was not aware of them either. <laughs> Why is there a number nine? That stands for 9th, 9th Calvary. Are we, yes, how old are you and how old are the horses? Well, I am 40-something. Uh, uh, Y'all stay in school and stay on them grades. Okay, All right. What we are doing is taking the legacy of the Buffalo Soldier into the cities and into the schools. And we feel that sharing this story, that we can instill some pride and resolve in them. These are the Seminole Indian Scouts. They were the best. Let me tell you, between 1860s and 1890s, during the Indian Wars period, they fought 24 battles, and they never lost a man. They were that good. They never lost a man. It was 200 Buffalo soldiers against 900 Kickapoos, Comancheros, and Mescaleros. 900 against 200 Buffalo soldiers. And we won in three hours. Well, how come this ain't up in our um, social studies book? Because I think Texas history. But much of our history did not get into the history book. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people who feel left out. I, I remember I used to feel left out until they came to my school and stuff, and then I knew. Because you know, they didn't teach us nothing in school, but that we were slaves. That's all they taught us. They didn't teach us that we were heroes or nothing. Every time you went to school in history, all you heard about was slaves this, slaves that. Here about no black heroes. Having the Buffalo Soldiers as heroes when I was growing up would have been great. My family come from just north of Waco, and my relatives and kinfolk, cowboys, man. But we didn't have any black cowboys or soldiers, you know, to really look up to. For me to have the black heroes there when I was growing up, that would have been instilled in me, that sense of pride. And I'm finding out late, but if I had grown up with that, uh, I could have had, you know, they would have been my heroes. From slavery to glory, 
I picked cotton, farm, and could not read or write. I am a soldier now. I have the eagles on my butt, U.S. on my buckle, and I can carry a gun and fight for my country. The question I pose to you today is what are we fighting for today? When we kill each other in gang wars, what are we fighting for? The Buffalo soldiers fought not only the Indians and outlaws, but racism and prejudice. We had a job to do, and we done it. Mark position, move. Ready. Aim. Fire. It seems ironic that 130 years after the Buffalo soldiers made their quiet mark in history, their greatest victory may be in the present, fought not with bullets, but with a legacy Honor, courage, and integrity. All right, class, what you think about that? And let's just go here. I've got something <laughs> for you. Did you like that? Yes. All right. Okay, let's. I'm going. I got something for you uh, right now. Uh, I'm going to bring on the screen, and I want you to take a close look at it. And, uh-oh, sorry about that. Let me get rid of this background, my mistake. I need to get rid of the background. There we go. Now we can see it. Okay. I wanna see if I can get it up closer to you. And let's see if we can get this light. What you see? What do y'all see? Okay. Can you uh, pick out the face of that uh, person on the front horse? Can you see it? Is that you? <laughs> no. Can you see it? Yeah. Is it clear? We no. see it. That's the cavalry. We see it. Yeah, but look at the face. Can you see the face? The man that was just on the show. Okay, that person lead. The person on that lead horse is Martin Luther King. And Frederick Douglass. Yeah. So this is the. Hey, Martin Luther. Yes, that is. Can you see? And so there are different figures <laughs> on the horse from our black history, from from uh, President Obama to Nelson Mandela to Rosa Parks. So, so each one of the horses has a historical figure riding on it. And I just want to show. I just want to share that with you. Okay, let's get back to the presentation. And if you notice the shirt that I'm wearing class is from the Negro League. All black baseball league. So let's get back to our presentation. All right. Okay. The uh, Buffalo Soldiers were, were was uh, the all black enlisted unit after the Civil War. Now, President Lincoln authorized these men to serve after the Civil War, but we know that President Lincoln, we know that um, he was assassinated. And so his replacement was Anthony Johnson, President Anthony Johnson, who was from the South. So he vetoed President Lincoln's bill. Congress stepped in on July 28, 1866, authorized two cavalry units, the 9th and 10th Cavalry, and authorized four infantry regiments, the 38th, 39th, 40th, and 41st Infantry Regiments. Now, one of those regiments was 
uh, special because there was one female who, cha who changed her name to Williams Kathy and served for two years as a female and no one really knew that she was a woman and she served in the 38th Infantry Regiment for two years. And her name was Cafe Williams, but she changed it and reversed it to Williams Kathy and was the only female Buffalo soldier that we know of. So the Buffalo Soldiers Cavalry Unit, uh, the ninth model was we can, we will. The 10th model was ready and forward. Now they developed those mottos because the jobs that they were given was harder than anybody else's job. All the other military units didn't get the same job. They would build the forts and then the white units would come in and move into the forts and they would sleep outside the fort. So the 9th and 10th Cavalry uh, missions were always missions where they were not supposed to come back. So they developed the mindset of there is nothing you will do or give me that I can't accomplish. So I'm saying to everyone in the class today, develop the mindset of the Buffalo soldiers. There is no job, there is no homework, there's no lesson that you can't do. You just develop a mindset of we can, we will, ready and forward. So when it's time for that homework, it's ready and forward, okay? Now the, the, the 38th, 39th and 40th and 41st eventually became two units. They became the 24th Infantry Regiment, which I was part of the 24th Infantry Division. And then you had the 25th Infantry Regiment. The horse units, the 9th and 10th Cavalry served from 1866 to 1944. The infantry served from 1866 to 1951 with the uh, 24th being the last one to be uh, effective or active. Now, the Buffalo Soldiers came right here to Florida, right in Tampa. If you ever go to Tampa, you, they, you Google the Buffalo Soldiers marker and you will see the marker. Why were they in, why were they in Tampa? Is because the Spanish-American War took place and the Buffalo Soldiers was the most experienced cavalry unit going over to Cuba. However, they, the United States wasn't prepared to fight outside of the United States. So the Buffalo soldiers had to leave their horses in Tampa and they all fought on foot. Teddy Roosevelt and the Rough Riders were the only ones to take their horses to Cuba. In our history books, they say Teddy Roosevelt and the Rough Riders charged up San Juan Hill. But in truth, in actual history, Teddy Roosevelt was on Kettle Hill and the Buffalo soldiers was on uh, San Juan Hill. The Buffalo soldiers secured San Juan Hill with other units. And, and Teddy Roosevelt came over after the fight and was actually escorted up San Juan Hill by the Buffalo soldiers. And when he got to the top of San Juan Hill, there was a Buffalo soldier standing there with the United States flag and his unit flag. So for everyone that uh, in the class, I want you to hear it clear and loudly, Teddy Roosevelt, and his rough riders who were not that rough did not charge up San Juan Hill. It was black soldiers who conquered San Juan Hill. Teddy Roosevelt was the only one with mil military experience. The rest of his rough riders was polo pony experts. Never ever been in the military a day in their life. So let's just kill that rumor of uh, Teddy Roosevelt charging up San Juan Hill. Now the officers of the Buffalo Soldiers, Colonel Hatch was responsible for the 9th Cavalry, Major Greason was responsible for the 10th Cavalry, and later on, John J. Blackjack Pershing was commander of the uh, Buffalo Soldiers. He got the name Blackjack because he was a commander of Black troops. Now let's talk about some of the Black officers. Lieutenant Henry O. Flipper graduated from West Point and was the first Black to graduate from West Point. It was one other Black, uh, Armstrong, that was ahead of him, but he did not graduate, couldn't handle the pressure. Every day, no one spoke to him for four years. Now, one social word was spoken to Henry O. Flipper for four years. He ate by itself for four years. And at West Point, you don't get to come home when the bell rings. You live and eat and go to school for four years straight at West Point. He survived that and became a second lieutenant, but because of the color of his skin, he could not command troops. So they made him a um, officer in the supply 
Now they later falsely accuse him of stealing petty cash and put him out the military, but he was a bri brilliant engineer. He developed a drainage system for the state of Oklahoma and they're still using his drainage system today. They call it Flipper's Ditch. Later, uh, President Carter restored his military honors and uh, awarded the, uh, uh, his honors to his family. Man in the middle is Colonel Charles Young. Colonel Charles Young was responsible for developing the park and ranger system that we have today. They protected all of our natural resources and Colonel Charles Young was later drummed out of the military because they said he was unfit. He later became the um, military uh, advisor for, for the Wilberforce uh, College. But to prove his fit, fitness, he rode his horse from Ohio to DC and got off and said, how you like me now? And he was ended up, uh, he was ended up giving a, an appointment over in Haiti where he eventually passed away. And the last gentleman you know from baseball, Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson did uh, break the color barrier in baseball, but before he broke the color in baseball, Jackie Robinson played football in Hawaii. Jackie Robinson left Hawaii two days before the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, landed in California, signed up in the military, well, drafted to go in the military, and was assigned as an, a corporal in the 10th Cavalry Fort Riley, Kansas. He later, later met Joe Lewis, who uh, uh, he told that he wanted to become an officer, and he worked it out so he could become an officer. And with that, he returned back to Fort Riley, Kansas as an officer. All right. Got you. I see you transitioning in 15, and I will make sure we get to the end. Thank you. Uh, so Jackie Robinson later became, uh, went from the 10th Cavalry to the 761st Tank Battalion. And 761st Tank Battalion was the first all black unit that went in World War II and they were known as the Black Panther. So the uh, 761st Tank Battalion was the Black Panthers long before the movie, all right? Uh, World War I, we had the Harlem Hell Fighters. Now, why is that important? Is because your teachers will recognize this. The Harlem Hell Fighters, band was the most renowned band in the U in, that went over to the Europe. When they came back, all of the HBCUs took the band members and made them directors of their bands. So every HBCU got their rhythm, got their music, got their swag from the Harlem Hellfighters 369th band. How about that? James Reese was head of the band and it had a Latin American uh, uh, feel to it because of the uh, Hernandez brothers. As we move out of World War I, we went into World War II where we call it the double V. This, this was the symbol for all black Americans in World War II around 1944. The double V meant that they, we wanted freedom, uh, victory over the Germans, and then victory over racism in the United States in 1944. Uh, some of the units, a uh, real quick highlight of some of those units, you had um, the Mumford Point Marines. This is the Red Ball Express. And again, this is that 369, excuse me, 761st Tank Battalion I was telling you about right here. Now let's talk about the women because let me, let me say this to you, class. I talked a lot about men. But during every segment that, that was going on, we had he hero, heroic women serving our country. Now, Roy, Ray Montague was the first person, black, white, male, whatever, to design a Navy ship by computers. She was told as a little girl, all she needed to worry about is cooking and having babies. She proved them wrong. She passed away two, two years ago and her rank at that time in DOD was equivalent to a CEO for a Fortune 500. Now these ladies right here are the Tuskegee Airmen. They trained the Tuskegee Airmen. They trained the Tuskegee Airmen and most were flying long before the men. 
This one here is the 6888 Central Postal Battalion. Their claim to fame is that they went into Europe when the other units couldn't, the other female units that were white couldn't. They took the mail that was two years behind and then turned around and got it on time in less than three months and it was never late again. And I will stop right here because I want to give the class some time to answer some questions. I know we got about five minutes left. So I'm opening up for questions. Any questions? Okay, if, if I don't have any questions, do I have any comments? We have one question. Yes. Were you a soldier? Yes, I was in the United States Army. I went in in 1977 and retired in 1997. Uh, after 20 years. We have a, a, a question. One, um, go ahead. Sir. So how did you help the end and to end segregation? How did you help end segregation was the question. How did I help end segregation? <laughs> I participated in segregation. Um, I really didn't help end it, but I was a part of it and watched us transition from uh, segregation to an uh, integrated society as we are today. And with that being said, can I ask the class, why do we have Black history in February? It's the birthday of Okay, Abraham Lincoln and okay, and who made it a month? Who is the person responsible for making it a month? Barack Obama. <laughs> no. No. Carter Luther King. No. Carter Luther King. I'm gonna start it off, Doctor. Doctor. Doctor Carter Johnson. There you go. Good job, Doctor Carter. Uh, good job, and Doctor Carter G. Woodson was responsible for for the month the month and he created the organization called asala asala is responsible for giving us the theme for black history month every year all right so um do i have any other questions before we end the tv not cut is really dummy i think that's it mr Sullivan. all right Cla well i appreciate y'all for giving me a chance to enter the classroom with you today uh thank you so very much and i look forward <laughs> to everyone in the class seeing you in history, being either doctors, lawyers, senators, whatever your desire is, I know you have the ability to do it. Again, thank you. Hey guys, tell Mr. Summon, thank you guys. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, all right, thank you. <laughs> Y'all have a great day, appreciate it. And I'm gonna let you, the classes log off. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And I'll let the classes classes lock off, log off. And we again thank everyone. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you. All right. All right. We want to thank all the students for coming in and we'll let the classes log off. I do have some other folks that were not in the class and I want to just talk with them. So I, uh, we want to end there. If the teachers, if you go ahead and log off, we want to thank you again. We appreciate you uh, giving me an opportunity. Okay, and Mr. Robbie, and if y'all will go ahead and log off, um, I appreciate you. Thank you. I appreciate you. And for all of the, uh, thank you, uh, sir. Mr. Robbie, if you would go ahead and log off, I thank you, appreciate you. And those that were listening in uh, on the class that I gave to the uh, students, I appreciate you as well this morning. Just wanna thank you again. My name is Joe and my company is JNet Enterprise. Uh, you can look me up on, at www.joetillman.com and you can book any one of my services online. I do do presentations as well. Uh, the two businesses are family planning and with Next Health Plan, uh, which covers is a nationwide plan. So Next Health is a nationwide plan 
uh, excuse me, ne Next Health is Florida, Georgia. It's an insurance health plan. It's affordable, less than Obamacare or Biden care. Family barrier plan is nationwide. So I had that backwards. You can book your appointments here online. We cover the whole United States. And if there's anyone uh, that is looking to uh, uh, look for additional income uh, and want to sell from home, this is something that you can reach out to me for as well. Again, I want to thank the, uh, the uh, students for giving me a chance to do the presentation for them for Black History Month, something that I'm very passionate about. And just know that we do Black History 365. We just promote it in February, just like you do your birthday, but it is not just for February. Black History is 365, seven days a week. With that being said, thank you everyone. And we're gonna close out here.